So welcome. This is the third talk uh, of <clears throat> astrophysics series of our observatory, Istanbul University Observatory. And today's speaker is a PhD candidate at University of Central uh, Lancashire, if I uh, pronounce correctly. Yeah, that's right. So <clears throat> good, good. And uh, he mainly works on exoplanets, as I know, and uh, stellar variabilities. And he developed a survey called MOSES. Uh, so beside exoplanets, his study topics inc include astrosismology, stellar nuclear synthesis, and cosmology. So <clears throat> Simon, it's your turn now. You can share your screen. OK, thank you. There we go. How does that look? Uh, that's perfect. We Good. see you well. I'm going to minimize this one. Um, I'm going to ask if people turn their cameras off just so we can maximize bandwidth, if that's okay. Um, and then just so nothing crashes so I don't get kicked out, if that's all right. Um, and then we'll get going. Is that okay? Yeah, that's all turned off right now. So it's okay. Okay, great. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you about uh, <clears throat> exoplanets or, well, particularly low mass companions. Um, and you'll see why I've called it that to uh, Delta Scuti stars. Um, <clears throat> and as I said before, I'm, I'm, my name's Simon. I'm a PhD student at the uh, University of Central Lancashire in, uh, in Preston in England. So what I'm talking about today is um, well, after we go through all the methods and stuff, the, 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 the results at the end are pretty new and haven't been published yet. So I'm going to ask people not to um, steal them, if that's OK. <laughs> we haven't fully got the results ready, uh, the, all the results ready for a publication. But uh, all this stuff is pretty new, so it's quite exciting. OK, so uh, low mass companions. So we, we're going to start with, oops. Um, <clears throat> The exoplanet field in general um, is only about 30 years old. Um, and until 1995, really, this is this is all we knew about the, uh, the universe and the galaxy. We thought there were eight planets or nine at the time, and then Pluto got demoted, but we thought there were eight planets. But <clears throat> obviously, we now know, due to some of the exoplanet missions, that there's planets all over the galaxy. So to, to give us a quick idea of how many planets there might be, um, <clears throat> this video from ESA will just zoom into the ultra deep field that Hubble took. <clears throat> and we can, and this is when we started to count how many galaxies there were in the uh, universe. To give us an idea of how many stars there are. So you can see in this small piece of sky, every single point of light is a galaxy. So they thought, okay, that's really good. There's two, on average, sorry, there's 200 billion average sized galaxies in the universe. Then they thought, well, we want to see how many stars there are in each galaxy. Oh, sorry about the music. <clears throat> and again, this is our Milky Way. So these um, pointed the Hubble telescope at the Milky Way and zoomed in again. Uh, Simon, sorry. Oh, hi. Uh, we only see the first uh, slide. Really? It didn't change. Oh, okay. Can you see? Uh, it move? No. Not me. It, it doesn't move, actually. It doesn't switch in. Oh, how weird. Maybe you can uh, just stop sharing and share yours. Yeah, I'll try again. Sorry about that. Okay, you can see this again? Uh, yes. yes. It's, see, it's not full screen right now, but we see your slides. That's fine. So I'm cycling through them now. Um, yeah. Press play. How about... Has it moved? No. Oh. How bizarre. Mm. 
will you use keynote live or i don't understand why that instead of clicking play is there a, a full screen mode yeah i put it uh Maybe you can restart the presentation part again. I don't. I don't think it's because of that. Maybe can you just hit F five? No, nothing happened. No, no, nothing happens then. Um, I could leave it like this. Okay. Um. And go through like this. I don't know if that's okay with everyone. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, it seems so. This is the solution for now. Okay, you can go on. Okay. Right. So, uh, this is this is just what we missed about how in the in the mid nineteen ninety up until the mid nineteen nineties when the exoplanet field started, this was our only view of the universe exoplanet wise. We thought there were eight. Well, we thought there were nine at the time, and then obviously Pluto has been demoted since. So we only thought there were eight, we knew there were eight planets, and we thought that. Our solar system was normal, that there were four rocky planets nearer the sun, or some rocky planets nearer the sun, and then big gas giants further out from the star. And then um, <clears throat> but since this since space missions such as uh, Kepler and Tess, which I'll come on to just after this, we now know that every star has at least one planet. So to give us an idea of how many planets there could be in the whole universe, first, we're going to have a look at this video where ESA uh, zoomed into where the Hubble ultra deep field was and counted all the galaxies and then extrapolated that across how big the sky was. So there's, and we now know that there's 200 billion large galaxies. <clears throat> so then each galaxy, sorry about this awful music, each galaxy, on average contains 200 billion stars. And this is our Milky Way zooming in towards the center. So then if we now know that each, each of the 200 billion galaxies contains 200 billion stars, this gives us this huge number, 14 and 21 zeros stars in the whole universe. And we know that each star now hosts a planet or on average will host one planet or more you can see that there is quite a few planets out there. But that's all good and well to say this is what we predict, but how do we actually find them? And a, um, a handful of exoplanets have been found from ground-based observatories, um, but there's a big problem. Well, not a big problem, but the main problem with being on the ground is that the sun rises every 12 hours. And I don't know what the weather's like in Istanbul today, but in Preston, it's it's actually clear, but it's cloudy and rainy for about 300 days a year. So it's impossible to do exoplanet science. So the best way to do that is to put your telescope into space. And <clears throat> this is uh, the Kepler Space Telescope that I'm sure you, you're all um, very aware of. And <clears throat> it was launched in 2009 and observed 150,000 stars continuously for four years during its primary mission. So here is um, Cygnus the Swan. So this is in the Northern Hemisphere. And then here's the Kepler Field of View. And 150,000 stars were observed, like I said, continuously for four years. And images were taken every two minutes for the short cadence data. And this is an example of one of the light curves of a, of a planet candidate it found. <clears throat> and it used something called the transit method. So here, if we just imagine this flux here, so this is a measure of the star's brightness over time, time along with the x-axis here in days, and it was measuring effectively 100% brightness. And then every now and then we saw these periodic tips and we thought, well, what's that? So <clears throat> we'll talk about how the transit method, how the transit method works. So here is a, uh, a video, it's a real video of the transit of Venus in 2012, transit of Venus across the sun. And like I said before, when you're measuring, when there's nothing in front of the star, you're measuring 100% brightness. 
then as something comes across, it will block out a fraction of the light. So you can see here it's blocked out 0.8% of the star's light. Then as this planet or whatever it is transits across the star and then e it's called egress at the end, the light goes back up to 100%. And you think, oh, well, that's interesting. Um, something's blocked out some of the light there. So we can obviously visually see this when it's planets our own solar system because we're close enough. But for distant stars, this is conceptually exactly the same. So now we can look back at this plot and we can see what's going on. So something has blocked out a small fraction of light. But because it does it periodically, uh, we know that this, this object must be in orbit around the star. If it was a random one-off transit, it could have been something in our solar system or a fault with a telescope. It could have been an asteroid by chance going in front of the field of view. But we know that if it's periodic, it's definitely bound to the same system. This little gap here is just because every now and then Kepler was pointed at the Earth to download uh, data. <clears throat> and this tells you a lot about an exoplanet already. The depth of the, the, depth of the dip gives you a, <clears throat> a ratio of the planet size compared to the star size, the planet's radius compared to the star's radius. And if you already know the stellar radius, then you, you already know the planetary radius as well. So that can give you information straight away about whether it's going to be a rocky type planet like the Earth or a big Jupiter sized planet. And obviously the distance between each dip is the, um, the planet's orbital period. Again, here it's about three days. So um, much faster than Mercury. It orbits much faster than Mercury orbits our, our star, our sun. And then the width of the dip is the planet duration, the transit duration, sorry. And this gives you another inkling into how far from the star the planet orbits. Obviously, with a three-day period, it's going to be orbiting fairly close. But with a, a short duration, you can also, sorry, you can also tell how fast it's moving with a short duration because it doesn't take long to transit the star. Or if it's a long duration, then it's something which is going to be further away from the star. Um, <clears throat> and then just to throw it in and to show off our telescope, we can detect planets from our observatory at our university now as well. Um, WASP-11b discovered in the WASP project, um, but we managed to get a transit a couple of years ago with our state-of-the-art telescope. So that's quite fun. So, <clears throat> and <clears throat> Kepler really proved that there were lots and lots of exoplanets out there, you know, from uh, this was in the 20, 2014 um, data download from Kepler. And you can see that the confirmed planets in blue, um, there were thousands, 2,800, and then 3,200 candidates in red. <clears throat> the difference between the planets and the candidates is that um, so the candidates might have only had one or two transits, and you really need three or more to start to think about maybe this is a real planet. If it was just a single transit, like I said, it could have been something in our solar system. Or um, the problem is that we've just not been looking for exoplanets long enough to confirm some of these longer period ones as well. If um, a civilization on another planet was trying to find the Earth, then obviously it'd take them three years to get three tr transits of the Earth around the sun. So likewise, a lot of these planets are gonna be orbiting far from their star. And so we just haven't been observing them long enough. So they're still candidates. But <clears throat> confirmed wise, in Kepler's small field of view, 115 square degrees of the sky, it found 2,800 in its first year, sorry, confirmed 2,800 in its first year. And that's just with the transit method. Only 5% of planets actually transit anyway, just because of orbital inclination. Um, if the orbit of a planet is between 85 and 90 degrees um, from the point of, from the point of view of the Earth, then it will transit. So that's zero to 85 degrees worth of planets that don't transit at all anyway. But that's a whole nother, um, whole nother talk talking about how to, how to find them. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> and the most interesting thing about this plot actually is that here, this is um, <clears throat> Earth radii. So here's where the Earth is, is on this line. And then 10 Earth radii is roughly where uh, Neptune is let's say Uranus and Neptune, <clears throat> and you can see that the most common sized planet discovered has a radius between 
Earth and Neptune. And that's something that we don't have in our solar systems. That's a nice little um, discovery from Kepler from what we, what we thought was normal, if you can think of our solar system as normal, it turns out to be not normal at all. Okay, so that was Kepler and then it uh, continued in its secondary mission up until 2016 or 17, something like that, and then was replaced in 2018 by uh, TESS, the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite. And this is the <clears throat> telescope, the space telescope that I've been using for my work. So <clears throat> a few differences to start with. Uh, Kepler was in a Earth trailing orbit, but was orbiting the sun. So every uh, every year was getting further away from the Earth, whereas TESS is in a 2-1 resonance with the moon. So orbits the Earth um, and goes out as far as the moon does, goes out to the lunar orbit but um, does that twice per calendar month, uh, per lunar month, sorry. <clears throat> and you can see here, it has four cameras, one, two, three, four, whereas Kepler only had one. So these cameras are stacked in a one by four array. And this is the field of view of TESS. So Kepler observed 115 square degrees for four years, whereas TESS observed 2,300 square degrees you can see here the, the four cameras, each field of view stacked in a one by four array. Um, <clears throat> but the payoff for that is that, um, and Tess wanted to do uh, an all sky survey, but the payoff for that is time. So obviously Kepler had four years or however, or even longer if he had enough um, funding and it didn't break to observe the same part of the sky, but to do with the whole sky, I think 96,000 square degrees or something it was, it had to have much shorter um, observation time spans. So you can see here, depending on a target's coordinates, so if a target is more towards the ecliptic, it'll have 27 days of observations. So like I said, that's a lunar month and tested two orbits within this time. But as if a target um, had a high declination or a low declination, depending on the hemisphere, you can see that it had almost up to a year of um, observation. And as we saw as well from that previous plot, a lot of these planets that we find, which is a st statistical bias, just because we haven't been looking for that long, but a lot of these planets have um, orbits within 10 days. So if it's nine days or fewer down here, then you can find the three transits and you're okay. So this was the data that I was using to have a look for uh, exoplanets for my project or for my PhD, see what I could find. Um, <clears throat> this is upside down, actually. This is the, you can imagine this is the ecliptic south pole. So it started in the southern hemisphere and then went into the northern hemisphere. Each hemisphere took a year during the primary mission. Now it's going along the ecliptic and filling in the gaps and doing some re-observations of other targets. So lots and lots of data. So Exoplanets are becoming quite common. As you saw on the previous slide as well, TESS is gonna is predicted to discover 20,000 from data after data has been analyzed from its primary mission. And with the current known total of 5,000, so that's an increase of 400%. And so exoplanets are becoming fairly common now. And I thought, well, this, you know, it's not gonna be very exciting to say, oh, look, here's another one. Uh, just another single transit of a hot Jupiter or something, a Jupiter-sized planet near its star. So I wanted to find something rare. So I thought, well, why not, why not marry this to the topic of astroseismology and the uh, the study of pulsating stars? And <clears throat> pulsating stars and all the different types and mechanisms and all why they are as they are. Um, oops, sorry. <clears throat> why they are as they are is a whole different talk. Um, <clears throat> so I'll keep it um, hopefully quite brief today, just so we can uh, talk about both as both fields together. So this is the this is a, a HR diagram for um, showing all the different types of pulsating star types, and. We're concentrating on this thing here. This is called the instability strip. 
and right on the main sequence or just off the main sequence on the instability strip lie something called delta scuti stars. And we focus on delta scuti stars because they are um, A-type stars and they're bright and they have very characteristic pulsation frequencies, which, um, which is good for when you want to try and model one of these stars. And being on the main sequence as well meant that they're likely to host planets. <clears throat> so the <clears throat> a good lower threshold of the temperature for these A-type stars, these delta Q stars, is 6,300 Kelvin. So we looked at all the published, not the published, sorry, we looked at all the, in the big database of test data, so it's all publicly available. <clears throat> we did a cut and excluded everything with host stars cooler than 6,300 Kelvin. And then um, basically by eye, plotted all the light curves and went through and plotted Fourier transforms, which we'll have a look at in a second, <clears throat> and went through by eye to have a look for some good examples. And we found, um, <clears throat> we found four examples um, that showed um, really high signal to noise, planet transits and stellar pulsations, because we want both of them to be as high signal to noise as possible. Otherwise, this work will get quite difficult quite quick. <clears throat> so we found four so far uh, that we're happy with. And so I'm going to concentrate on just one today that we've uh, that we've nearly got ready uh, to publish. So uh, this is tick 409934330. And you can see this is from sector 13. So if you if you let's get back and have a look, there's sector 13. So it was taken just at the end of the first year of the primary mission. It's now had um, a, a secondary observation in sector 31, I think, and it's going to have a third one in sector 67, which won't even happen for another few years. But it's uh, predicted to get more data, which is good. And you can see here, like the capital light curve I showed you before, <clears throat> This is just normalized to make it a bit easier to see how deep the transit is. But there's the 100% flux, and then there's this very periodic planet. And there's a bit of data download there as well. <clears throat> but this is a, uh, a pulsating star. And we know this for the fact that you can see that this 100% this flux, I keep calling it, isn't uniform. You can sort of see, you can sort of follow pulsations. So this is a um, visual representation of the star <clears throat> expanding and contracting and increasing in brightness and decreasing in brightness as it does through its uh, pulsation cycle. And this is showed here as well, is that the depth of the planet transit is different for each period, for each orbit. So this shows that there's definitely something going on with the star as well. So let's take a Fourier transform and have a look. Um, <clears throat> oh, I just meant, forgot to say, this is the spectral type. Um, it's a bit complicated because there's a lot going on with the star and not, they can't, um, this is from Simbad, and it's, it's hard to pin down exactly which spectral type it is. But what's important is that it's an AM star. And we'll come back to that um, just at the end. And then just, just for uh, temperature on the HR diagram, 8,050 Kelvin. So it's quite a hot star. So here's the Fourier transform of the light curve, and you can see um, there's two sections to this, basically. There's stuff down in the low frequency, and then a lot of stuff in this mid, mid, maybe a bit in the high frequency as well. So here, this, this peak here, right down at 0.4, is the uh, frequency of the orbital period of the planet. So that's fine. So we can, um, we can remove that and remove all these harmonics because these are all equally spaced. You can see some flare up down here as well. So we remove the period and the um, harmonics just to relieve the pulsation frequencies. So there we go. And now they've been removed. And there's a few little frequencies down here, but all of these ones are the important ones for <clears throat> the work we want to do. And these are very um, <clears throat> typical of a delta scuti pulsator, mid to high frequencies. Of pulsations and then the x-axis here cycles per day <clears throat> so if there's one here at 24 cycles per day that means it's pulsating in this frequency once and once per hour so down here at 12 would be uh <clears throat> once every two hours 
and I've gone up to 48 so that this peak here is a pulsational frequency that uh, the star will pulsate with this frequency every 30 minutes. So you can see this is quite a, this is quite a um, there's quite a lot of different pulsations and different each one of these frequencies will be a, a different radial shell within the star. So if you think about this in 3D and it's all uh, all of these are pulsating together. So <clears throat> there's a lot going on with this star. So the first thing to do then would be to model this star. Um, <clears throat> I don't really have anything exciting to show you image wise or picture wise doing these models because all it does, you put in numbers and uh, you put in your um, <clears throat> equations of state and what physics you want to model. And then it outputs a number, another number. So it's not very exciting, this bit is just text. <clears throat> But we model these stars with two programs. Uh, one's called Mesa, and one's called Gyra. And <clears throat> Mesa models the stellar evolution. So we start with um, effectively a big molecular cloud, and um, on the pre-main sequence, <clears throat> and the <clears throat> the model has a set. Uh, what uh, I'm going to say routine, but I don't want to use that word, is basically a set evolution for pre-main sequence stars. But once it hits the <clears throat> uh, main sequence, you can then tell it, um, give it priors and give it parameters, such as <clears throat> starting mass, um, metallicity, um, even what age you want to get it to, what luminosity and different equations of state, stuff like that. <clears throat> um, but there are three main things three main parameters that we iterated over following the work of um, somebody called Victor Kalak. And he suggested these are the three main priors you need to change. So obviously stellar mass is, is a really important one. And we did a back of the envelope calculation with parameters such as the star's temperature and luminosity, and then you can work out the distance from the Gaia parallaxes. <clears throat> and that gave us a stellar mass of 2.25 to 2.3 solar masses. And we thought, okay, that's good. So we increased that range for the MESA program and said, can you iterate over every stellar mass between 2.2 and 2.4, going up in increments of 0 0.01 stellar masses. Uh, the second parameter then we had to iterate over was the stellar rotation. Um, so we started... Uh, we did between 20 and 100 kilometers per second. 20 being a lower limit of uh, AM stars. Again, this is why this AM was important. And 100 kilometers per second being the upper limit for AM. So that gives our range straight away. Uh, I think one AM star has been found to rotate at 120 kilometers per second. But in the literature, most, if not all people, um, agree that 100 kilometers is the upper limit. So that's fine. So that gives our stellar rotation. So we incremented in per one kilometer per second of that. And then the third element was something called convective overshoot, which <clears throat> I'm not gonna go into much at the moment because that's a whole nother talk as well, but that's a lot of internal um, heat transfer mechanisms and things like that. And this convective overshoot parameter is unitless and it's just how, uh, it just defines <clears throat> how much, how far from the core it's a, it's a parameter that defines how far from the core um, big, uh, I'm going to use the word identity, it's a single identity of material can mix from the core out to the radiative and the convective zones. <clears throat> but like I said, that's a whole other talk, but just for the purpose of this, that was the third parameter to um, measure. And as the convective overshoot increases, the stellar radius per standard luminosity increases. So it is important. So with um, increments of 0 0.01 here, and then increments of 1 here, and increments of 0 0.001 here, you can see that there were quite a few models being made. And after we made all those, um, we then, these two models, uh, these two programs work together. So an output of the MESA model, which gives you a star and its evolution, can be fed into uh, Gyra, which models the stellar pulsations. So after you've got your star, the gyra gets the star pulsating, and then for um, every single iteration here, so for the three parameters, it will 
it will get the star pulsating and output the pulsational frequencies that a star of that mass rotation with that convective overshoot. Um, again, with the temperature, which we already know from, um, from TESS, from TASOC is 8,050. <clears throat> It'll give you a list of, of pulsation frequencies that that's, that such a star would pulsate at. So then we can, once we've got our, we've got our Fourier transform, we remove um, the, the highest amplitude pulsations. So we went down to um, 0.15. So I think this one here was probably our cutoff. And we just um, extracted these frequencies um, and then improved them using a program called Imperio, period of four, um, improved them to make sure we knew they were exactly right. And then um, <clears throat> compared them against the pulsational frequencies that gyra outputted for each of the Mesa models. And then you can just do this with a chi-squared analysis. And then the chi-squared, which is mathematically compares all of the frequencies against all of the models and then outputs the best model, the, the gyra model with the closest matching pulsational frequencies. <clears throat> and so you can see results so far, we got a stellar mass of 2.26 solar masses um, plus an error propagation, which I've not finished yet. So I've just admitted that, but there will be an error. And it gave a stellar radius of 5.2 solar radii. So this star, as we already predicted, because it's in A type and with 8,050 8, Kelvin as its effective temperature, is going to be more massive and bigger than the sun. So this is good. We now have um, results for the star. Um, <clears throat> so the next, obviously, is the companion mass we've got the star. We want the uh, we want to model the transiting planets. So we do this instead, <clears throat> instead of the transit method, we do this with um, radial velocity. So <clears throat> um, I hope this isn't too um, patronizing. I didn't want mean it to be. I just wanted to try and explain how radial velocity works. Is this even going to work? There we go. So on a road, as a car or a vehicle comes towards you, this works best with a siren. The, as the vehicle comes towards you, the sound waves are compressed. And then as the vehicle goes past you, the sound waves are stretched. And so this makes a siren of an ambulance or something sound higher pitched when it comes towards you. And then lower pitch as it goes past you. This is something everybody I'm sure knows about. But the exact same thing happens with stars. So this is very much, oops, this is very much not a scale, but this is a star moving towards the Earth through the galaxy. And the same thing again, you're measuring the star's light. As the star's moving towards you, the light waves, the rays of the wavelength of light becomes slightly compressed. And equally, if the star was moving away from you, the wavelength of light would be stretched. <clears throat> and so measuring light from a star. So this, this is the, uh, this is the sun. Um, measuring this light from this, this a star, and you uh, each star has its own um, fingerprints, we call it, uh, these absorption lines. So for example, and these are all different chemical elements or molecules, things like that. For example, this big one up here is hydrogen. Uh, these two here are helium. And then there's oxygen, nitrogen, and all sorts of other uh, chemical elements and molecules that are in the sun's atmosphere. So exact same with any other star, uh, you measure the wavelengths of light, you see you measure the light and you can see these absorption lines in, in its spectra. <clears throat> but if this star is moving towards you or away from you, then these wavelengths of light will be either compressed or stretched. So that means that um, the uh, approaching star. Oh, this doesn't quite work because the animation is not working. Sorry. Let's see if we can get that going. No. Okay. Sorry about that. So this is meant to move to the left and this one's meant to move to the right. And this is to prove that the sun spectral lines or some, or synthetic spectral lines that we know that we can make in a laboratory, um, are a very specific wavelength and are the same everywhere. But an approaching star has its wavelength of light compressed. 
So everything will be shifted down towards the blue end of the spectrum because this is shorter wavelength. Um, or vice versa, if the star's moving away from us, the wavelengths will be stretched. So everything will have a longer wavelength and everything will be moved towards the red. So this is um, obviously the definitions of blue shift and red shift. So this is the video we saw before. And this is, this is what um, <clears throat> you could be forgiven for thinking is that the planets orbit the star and the star remains stationary because it holds most of the mass and that is true. But there is obviously a tiny fraction of mass made up by the planets. So the star, the sun in this case, does orbit the central mass of the solar system as does everything. But the central mass of the solar system is so similar in space, so close to the central mass of the star, it's effectively the same place. But it does have a small, it does orbit very slightly the common central mass. So let's look at an exaggerated example of this now. A single star and a single planet. And this planet is pulling on this star as the planet orbits. You can see as the star comes around towards the observer, these spectral lines are blue shifted. And then as it goes away from the observer, the spectral lines are red shifted. And you can see that that happens fairly periodically. So we can we do this. We did this exact same um, principle with our star. Take 499934330. And we did this with uh, data from uh, SALT, the Southern African Large Telescope. So I, uh, I, made, I wrote a proposal and it was accepted and we asked them to perform uh, 18 separate visits um, to collect to measure the wavelength of this of our star and this is one of the spectra it produced so it performed 600 second exposures in two beams um red and blue a little bit of overlap and this is the full um spectra from salt of my star. So um, we concentrated just on the blue beam. As you can see, the red is quite messy and there's a lot going on here, a lot of uh, telluric lines in, from our atmosphere, which can get in the way. So we, uh, we took just the blue and then we normalized it um, just about, a bit dodgy up here, but effectively normalized. And this is what we got. <clears throat> everything here is real apart from these four straight lines here which are just faults in the um in the beam in the detector <clears throat> and thought okay this is really good so we've got 18 of these this is just one um so the first thing to do was to correct them all for barycentric velocity which uh, removes the <clears throat> uh, the motion due to the earth and then we created a synthetic spectrum um, by typing in parameters of the star that we already knew. So, so uh, temperature, for example, um, log G, again, all of this is, was available on the TESS website um, <clears throat> for where, where, on the TASOC website, sorry, where we got the data from. How are we doing for time? Oh, that's fine. <clears throat> so, this synthetic spectrum then is what this program thinks this star or would, would knows this star would emit, uh, sorry, it knows what the absorption lines would be if this star weren't moving. And you can see pretty much is laid over the top. But when we zoom in a little bit, we can see that the, the, uh, the bottom of these peaks, uh, the bottom of these dips is very slightly off, uh, moved to the right. And so this means that the wavelengths of these um, absorption lines have been very slightly redshifted. So we know that this star is receding. Um, <clears throat> going back to the A-type stars as well, um, <clears throat> sorry, the AM-type stars as well, they are defined by different chemical abundances. So we can see here, uh, now I'm definitely going to get this the wrong way around, but I believe that these ones are the uh, some magnesium lines, and it's 
overabundant. Oh no, so these might be the these might be the iron lines then. They're overabundant. So you can see here that the blue is the observed spectra and the red line is the synthetic. And you can see that for some most of those lines up, up here and throughout the spectra, they match fairly well. But for these absorption lines, our spectra was overabundant in these elements. And then vice versa in the heavier elements. So I think these ones are iron rather than those ones. Oh no, these ones are magnesium because they're underabundant. You can see the synthetic spectrum here predicted, like this line, they predicted um, absorption lines here, whereas in our spectra, there were none. So this is extra clarification that this is an uh, AM star. This is very characteristic of an AM star. So we got um, 18 visits and we knew that all of the <clears throat> we knew that a star in all of the visits was receding and each um, <clears throat> after calculating so once we corrected for barycentric velocity we then calculated the the difference between the wavelengths of all these peaks uh, all these dips sorry and that gave us a, a radial velocity a receding velocity rather <clears throat> which was on the order of minus 11 kilometers per second um, <clears throat> but once we uh, we again normalize this and it produced the radial velocity because the star itself would be receding at on the order of 11 kilometers per second but within that would be a small um, periodic change and that would be its true radial velocity due to the planet and here we go <clears throat> i must admit though i noticed this morning that i have um i'm out by an order of uh, a factor of a thousand because I put in kilometers per second into this plot rather than meters per second. So we have to read this as kilometers per second because otherwise this number is um, <clears throat> 60 centimeters and that's just too small, that's not true. So this is kilometers per second, I'm afraid, but these are our data points. And then this has fit a curve to it. So here we have um, the amplitude of 600, just about meters per second in radial velocity. So this is large, this is gonna be a big companion. And this is why we've been using the word companion rather than exoplanet, because this guy, this uh, companion um, is pretty big. So again, there's um, <clears throat> a large error on these <clears throat> data points, which is a shame, but that's just the resolution of the salt data. Um, it'd be nice if we can get some time on another um, spectroscopic telescope to have a look at how that compares to the salt data. But with a best fit line and a maximum amplitude of 600 meters per second, 0.6 of a kilometer per second, we are <clears throat> fairly happy that we've been able to do this. So how does that compare then I've uh, with some RVs in the data? I've already said it's fairly large, but how do we know? So let's have a look at some uh, RVs in the, in the literature. So um, in Loon et al, they have a 7.6 meters per second mm -hmm. RV curve for <clears throat> a, a sub-Jupiter mass. They're, they don't give you a specific number, a specific value for this uh, planet's mass, but it's definitely sub-Jupiter. So this is on the order of, you know, under 10 meters per second. And this is quite small. Um, I think that the Jupiter, Jupiter around orbiting the sun induces a radial velocity of 13 meters per second. So that kind of makes sense, 7.6 sub Jupiter, and then the Jupiter itself would be 13. So let's look at the other end of the spectrum of some of these big exoplanets or even um, companions. And then Mitchell in 2013 published two. So we'll start with a smaller one and uh, 91.5 meters per second in radial velocity is a 3.2 Jupiter mass planet. So, you know, bigger already than we have in our solar system. <clears throat> and then um, <clears throat> the other planet is 350.2 meters per second in radial velocity, which is enormous. This is 20.6 masses per ju uh, Jupiter masses. So now we're on brown dwarf territory. <clears throat> and, uh, this object, we've got 600 meters per second, so twice as big again. Um, <clears throat> so it doesn't follow it doesn't follow a linear path, of course, 
But if we were to double this or even take another 10 mass Jupiter masses, 30 to 40 Jupiter masses is what we're looking at already. Um, so this is definitely uh, brown dwarf territory. So this is why we've been using the word companion rather than exoplanet for this case. So let's look at the results again. Um, so we've got the same stellar mass and radius, obviously. The radial velocity here, 600 meters per second, gives um, the companion mass and radius as um, I predicted already it to be a brown dwarf. But this is literally how far we've got, got up to. I only even finished the radial velocity stuff last week. So these calculations will be completed this week. Um, <clears throat> so this is really, um, really, really brand new stuff. But it's exciting because scouring through the literature to find other examples to compare it against, um, there's only other one. There's one other brown dwarf orbiting an AM star. TOI 503. The TOI stands for the Test Object of Interest. This is what uh, test data gets designated once it's found, once they've found a, um, a potential for a planetary transit. So once it becomes a planetary candidate, it becomes a test object of interest. TOI 503. So <clears throat> with this one, this was discovered in 2019. And so this is the second example that we know of, the brown dwarf orbiting an AM star. So watch this space for this to be published, and hopefully this we can confirm that it, it, that it is the second such example. Uh, 20 past 10. Okay. <clears throat> or oh, of course, it's 20 past 1 when you are. Okay, so here we go. Future work now. So we've got the planetary, we've got the stellar mass and radius, and the stellar and the model pulsations from Mesa and Gyra. So we've got the, pretty much a good model of the star. And we've got the radial velocity. So we sort of, we have got a pretty good inkling of what the um, companion parameters, uh, what companion size is. We know it's probably gonna be a brand dwarf. So the next step would be to put both of those into a, uh, to model both of those together to get a full orbital uh, model of the system. So this would give us a true value for the companion radius and would give us the proper orbital properties such as the semi-major axis, things like that. So we know precisely how big this companion is, how far from the star it's orbiting um, <clears throat> and all those parameters. <clears throat> so here, this one, compare stellar companion parameters against known pulsating host stars. So this is the, the whole point of what I'm doing here is that these are rare. Um, and I, I didn't know how rare, um, but when we look, go back, if you remember back to the HR diagram, I'll, um, I'll, I'll show you now actually, it'll be a bit easier, here we go. On this uh, instability strip and this Delta Scuti region, there's only seven published exoplanets and actual exoplanets around stars with Delta Scuti pulsations hotter than this temperature threshold. Um, and there's about 20 brown dwarfs around Delta Scuti stars. So this, you know, this is a small niche within the exoplanet catalog. <clears throat> so I intend to um, <clears throat> create some HR diagrams with the planets and the brown dwarfs and then see how my object fits in with those. And <clears throat> if it fits into the same small region in parameter space as the others, we can start to say there's, these are pre, these are we're fairly certain these are constraints for such objects to exist. Um, <clears throat> and if it doesn't, if it's somewhere in a different part of the parameter space, well, that's interesting because it means there aren't the constraints we previously thought. But we want to try and answer the question of why these systems are so rare. What what is it about pulsating stars or rather delta scuti stars that don't allow for as many planets? or companions to form around them as <clears throat> as with normal <clears throat> as with lower mass stars at the f and g's like the sun um another thing i didn't mention finally is that <clears throat> i also have um four or five runs at the 14 telescope at the saa the southern Af southern african astronomical Obs observatory and we did <clears throat> we got some more we're observing again this week actually and here we're observing the star in different color 
wavelengths in different filters. So TESS um, only observes in a, a wave band between mm -hmm. 600 nanometers and 1,000 nanometers, so in the R and the I. Uh, and we are observing the star in five filters, U, B, V, R and I. Um, <clears throat> the R and I seems a bit silly because TESS has got, is going to have uh, better data, but it's just to compare like, like for like. But what's important here is it's U, B and V. So we are looking at the transits in different wavelengths and looking at it, looking at them in different wavelengths will give a different um, relative depth per waveband. So the absolute depth of the transit will stay the same, but the relative depth, depth will change. And this will allow us to uh, <clears throat> derive the limb darkening values of the host star so we can get a more complete understanding and better model of the host star. Um, and give us some atmospheric properties of the of the companion and i'll give a tighter constraint on the companion's radius as well so this entire process is quite iterative because we've gone through it once and we've got the stellar model and the planet model now we're doing some more observations to get better <coughs> better constraints on those values which we can we can put those parameter back into the models and create a second secondary set of models which is more constraint and with smaller errors and that will give us an even a more precise answer and so the whole process is sort of iterative and we can do it two or three times to get to reduce the errors uh which is in, which is what we want to do so um so that's where we're up to um <clears throat> like i said it's really brand new stuff this and so watch the space in the next few months for the publication um so there we are i hope um Thank you for listening. I hope um, I hope you got something out of it, and I hope it was interesting. And I'm just going to end on this video, <clears throat> just to show you. Um, this video shows you how many exoplanets have been discovered um, as the years go on, and the colour of the circle is the method that was used to discover them. <clears throat> Obviously, a few methods we haven't talked about today. Uh, we've only talked about radio velocity and transit but this is just to show how quickly the exoplanet field is increasing <clears throat> so again radial velocity was dominant until kepler was launched and this is the kepler field growing up here and then this is the big first data download from Kepler, and the second one's coming. <clears throat> and then it started observing along the ecliptic. <clears throat> this is slightly out of date now. This is a pre-COVID video. But this is this is where we're up to in 2019, 4,003 planets. So we've got about a thousand more now confirmed. And TESS is hopefully going to increase that by a few hundred percent as well. So there we go. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Uh, thank you, Simon. Uh, it was very interesting talk. Uh, so we have time for questions from the audience, if there is any. Yes, Sholen, you can. Ah, hello, Simon. Thank you for the nice uh, talk. And um, I was wondering, Actually, there, there, there's just a few things I did not understand. That's what I was trying to, I wanted to ask you that. Uh, so you said, um, if I'm mistakenly understood incorrectly, but, but this is, uh, you, you told us like this, is the, this brown dwarf discovery is the second discovery around the Delta Scuti types. But then you also mentioned something like, um, the, the, there are the the the, the uh, this in, in the instability strip around the uh, um, Delta Scutis. There are at least twenty brown dwarfs detected. That 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 maybe I gonna I don't know what I got confused at. Oh, so there's <clears throat> there's about twenty brown dwarfs known around A type stars. Ha, A type stars, yeah. not Delta Scutis. Sorry, yeah. Okay. Sorry, okay. That, oh, that was my, stars. Okay. Uh, no, I probably said that incorrectly. I meant I meant to say A type stars there. A type star. Maybe I understood that because you were showing. I thought the, the instability strip, so I was I got confused as well. Oh okay. no, that okay. that would have been my okay, fault. Okay, so this is the second such okay detection. 
All right. Um, all right. So what the, the second little question I have, uh, perhaps this is not a more a comment or a question, perhaps. Um, um, so these um, brown dwarfs, uh, in, in even like evolution of CVs uh, in, in, in general, when we look into the evolved systems, we, we, we have some difficulties finding uh, period bouncers and things like that. And, and whenever it's sort of evolved species, we find these brown dwarf like um, secondaries. Okay, they're irradiated, they're hot, but then uh, they're completely stripped. That's because of the uh, long years of uh, accretion and so forth. And in, in any ways, what I'm trying to uh, get at is um, um, so in, in is, is this star um, basically is, is, is you have this uh, delta scuti star which is a pulsator, okay? And this pulsator is basically uh, sending out a radiation field which is varying, right? And this radiation field. Um, I, I forgot to, I was just checking the luminosities, but I kind of got to, you, you changed your slide, so I kind of couldn't see it. But then I don't know how high it is, but then um, I was wondering, uh, but, but perhaps my, this is um, stellar luminosity, uh, sun, in terms of sun luminosity, so it's like over 10 to the 33 Earths per second, as I see. And, and so, um, and what I'm trying to get at is this, I'm trying to make it longer, but uh, so this varying field, I don't know how the luminosity, how much the luminosity is actually varying in terms of delta L, but this, you're sending out this uh, radiative field. And, and I was wondering, you're getting these brown dwarfs, but perhaps they didn't start as brown dwarfs in the sense they were some sort of a small size um, gas giant, perhaps. And then it got completely stripped out, got stripped. And, and you're perhaps seeing the core of the giant. Could that be a possibility? And then uh, uh, perhaps, I don't know, having a gas giant around uh, that is perhaps more rare than just having, um, I don't know. Uh, so I, I, I'm, I'm not so much into exoplanets. I'm not an exoplanet guy for that matter. But I was wondering, uh, would that, uh, I mean, uh, be uh, rather than making a brown dwarf around the um, get, getting a brown dwarf around the um, the um, sort of evolving a brown dwarf around the, um, uh, the, the, the the star, can you have a sort of a, a sort of a ripped out and, and a sort of in, a, a, uh, radiate yeah, by, by ripped out by radiation, some uh, other type of uh, planet, but then turns out into a, a brown dwarf. Is that a possibility, or am I just not I'm making things up <laughs> and confusing <laughs> you and everybody else? <laughs> no, no, no. So, um, yeah, you're right to say that the, the planets around the uh, well, the seven planets that we know of around pulsators like with a temperature higher than 6300 Kelvin. <clears throat> but the it, it's not likely to be a planet um, because of the uh, the, uh, the amplitude of the RV curve. So I said that a, a Jupiter-sized planet pulling on the sun pulls at about. So 13... I thought you said, but brown dwarf is not a Jupiter like. Ah, brown well, dwarfs are similar too. Yeah, but are, but but are brown dwarfs have enough uh, almost like uh, like Jupiter-sized gaseous stuff around it? Brown dwarfs. I thought they're, they're more ripped out. Then but maybe way, I am wrong. They're way more massive, though. So that's what I was trying to say. They're, they're way more massive. So on the order of 30 to 40, well, 20 plus Jupiter masses. So this object probably is more of a brown dwarf than a Jupiter just because the RV signals so much higher, 600 meters per second. You're not going to get that from the planet. Yes, yes, than Jupiter. Right. Um, I mean, that you would imagine then. I assume, I, I, I yeah, imagine, I assume so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And even okay, that's I'm, I'm I'm imagining it incorrectly in the sense that it is not a completely rip, uh, a more of that you're not seeing the, the sort of the core of a uh, more, no. more like core region of a Jupiter. This is much more massive. So oh, yeah, it's more the, gaseous atmosphere. Yeah, than it, Jupiter would anyways in any ways. Yeah, even if it's just a brown dwarf. Okay. 
Yeah, okay. it just hasn't. So I, I, when, when you say having a brown dwarf now, I'm imagining, I always keep thinking because of the the, the, the way, okay, we, we, we see things in a different field, of course, brown dwarfs having like very stripped uh, atmospheres, you know, because of, 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 I'm thinking in, in, in a secondary turning into a brown dwarf. So, okay, I understand uh, your point now. Okay, so it is not, but per perhaps then, Ah, that, then there could still be uh, some form of, uh, uh, because of the pulsations, perhaps some uh, irradiation going on and, and perhaps some, that, that should perhaps create some differences for that. Yeah, um, that, yeah. I think that, that's sort of why we think these objects are so rare. Um, okay. But uh, that's, the, that's sort of the end. That's the, that's the goal we're going to try and answer at the end once I finish my analysis. Okay. All right, so little confusion, but I understood. Both. Yeah, no, yeah, <laughs> okay. my, my mistake. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any other question? Uh, it seems there is no any other question to you, Simon. So we thank you again for this great talk. Thank and you. We wish you luck in your PhD defense and your research. Thank you very much. Um, keep an eye out for this um, when it gets published. <laughs> yeah, we will. Thank you. So, Thank you. Uh, so see you all in our next meeting on next Monday. See you. See you. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye. Bye.